let me welcome you as well to worship today. It's great to see you. Uh, we're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 today. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. And we're going to be talking about some life lessons that Solomon gave us. Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes and he's reflecting on his life. I think he's an old man at this point and he is looking back on his life. He's thinking about some things that God has taught him. Now, what are some of the most valuable life lessons that you've learned? Well, I bet if you had a few moments, you could share some of those with us. I could share with you a lot of lessons. You know, when you travel around the world as I have, then you, you learn lessons when you go into different countries. You learn some things to do and some things not to do. I learned that you don't use colloquialisms when you write sermons and preach sermons in other countries because uh, if you use something like, it's raining cats and dogs, that just doesn't translate into Bahasa Indonesia for some reason. I'm not sure why they don't understand that. But, and I learned that when I moved to Alabama, there are certain things that, uh, that everybody knew in Mississippi that some of the folks over here in Alabama just didn't seem to know. Like one day I wanted a snack, and so I got a snack, and I said, I think I'd like to have some nabs. And somebody in the office looked at me and said, what in the world is a nab? And I said, well, you know, it's those little cheese crackers. Sometimes they've got peanut butter in them. Sometimes they've got cheese in the middle of them. You, you said, oh, we don't call those. Or call something else over here. And I thought, well, well, they said, why you call them nabs in Mississippi? I said, well, I don't know. That's what they always called them. I, maybe it's because the Nabisco company made some of them. I don't know, but that's why we call them. So you learn lessons along the way. Some are trivial. Some are gravely important, and you can't afford not to miss the lesson, because you know what happens if you miss the lesson God's trying to teach you? You get to learn it all over again. You get to go through that thing all over again in hopes that you can learn that the second time around or the third or the fourth time around. Well, Solomon has some lessons that he's learned from life and he wants to share with us. And so we're going to start with Ecclesiastes chapter 9, and I'm going to read beginning with verse 1 and down through verse 10. So I'm not sure which translation of the scripture you'll be using, so it may be a little bit different. Um, this is the NASB. Solomon said, verse 1, For I have taken all this to my heart, and explain it that righteous men, wise men, and their deeds are in the hand of God. Man does not know whether it will be love or hatred. Anything awaits him. It is the same for all. There's one fate for the righteous and for the wicked, for the good and for the clean and for the unclean, for the man who offers a sacrifice and for the one who does not sacrifice. As the good man is, so is the sinner. As the swearer is, so is the one who is afraid to swear. This is an evil in all that's done under the sun, that there is one fate for all men. Furthermore, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil, and insanity is in their hearts throughout their lives. Afterwards... They go to the dead. For whoever is joined with all of the living, there's hope. Surely a live dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know they will die, but the dead do not know anything, nor do they any longer, uh, nor have they any longer a reward, for their memory is forgotten. Indeed, their love, their hate, their zeal have already perished, and they will no longer have a share in all that's done under the sun. Go then, eat your bread in happiness, and drink your wine with a cheerful heart, for God has already approved your works. Let your clothes be white all the time, and let not oil be lacking from your head. Enjoy life with the woman whom you love all the days of your fleeting life, which he has given to you under the sun, for this is your reward in life and in your toil in which you have labored under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for there's no activity or planning or knowledge or wisdom in Sheo where you're going. Let's pray together. God, we're grateful for this opportunity to worship you. We are so thankful for giving us life and breath. Thank you for blessing us in so many ways. Thank you for letting us gather in this place, in this wonderful country, to worship you uh, in this, this place that we call Forest Lake Baptist Church. God, we are so blessed. And yet, as we think about our life and all the things that you have taught us, sometimes we let those lessons slip. Sometimes we fail to live by them. Sometimes we fail to pass them on to others. 
So would you get our attention this morning? Would you help us to listen to you, to hearken to the voice that's coming from heaven and calling our names and trying to teach us those things that are most valuable and most precious because life certainly is fleeting, as Solomon underscores in this passage. Fathers, we worship you today. Help us to lift up Jesus, our Savior, who lived and died for us and rose again so that our sins could be forgiven and we could know you and have a place there in heaven with you forever and ever. And we submit all of this to you now and pray that you would be honored and pleased by it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, what are some simple life lessons? Well, those are going to be on the screen if you want to take some notes. Um, nothing profound that I have this morning, but I think God gives us some profound things from this passage. The first thing that I see that Solomon learned is that God is sovereign. God is sovereign. He is, as we say, the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. There is none greater than He and he says in this passage, in reference in verse 1, he talks about the hand of God. Do you see that? You might want to underline that in your scripture. He talks about God's hand. And when someone references a person's hand, and specifically the hand of God in scripture, he's talking about God's ability to be in control, that God is sovereign, that God uh, orchestrates, that God moves, that, that he has the ability and power that no one else has. And he's reassuring us here, I think, that God's hand is on us to protect us and to provide for us. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we doubt that. Sometimes we complain about that when life is not as sweet as we would like for it to be. But Solomon tells us about the hand of God being upon us. I remember several years ago, I was sharing with a fellow pastor about some of the things that God was doing in and through our church. And he just made the ob observation. He said, well, you know, it's obvious that God's hand is on your church. Now, I don't know everything I want to know about the hand of God, but I want the hand of God on me. Amen. Do you want the hand of God on you? I want God's hand on me and on our church to provide for us, to direct us, to help us in whatever way we might need. And I think that's what Solomon is referencing here. He's reassuring his children, his grandchildren, uh, the people that are under his reign, that God's hand is on them and God is going to take care of them. Jesus did the same thing in the Scriptures. He talked about how he was the great shepherd and the great shepherd would look, at, look after his sheep. John chapter 10 and verse 27, he said, "'My sheep hear my voice.'" And I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will ever snatch them, there it is, out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. God is in control. God supervises. God orchestrates, and God is watching over our lives. But not only us, friends, not only those of us who claim the name of Jesus, but God's control and God's sovereignty reaches to the entire world. Our God is not just the God of Christians, but he's also the God of Muslims, even though they don't know that yet. He's also the God of Buddhists, even though they don't know that yet. They're not worshiping him. They're not seeking after him. But he's still God. That doesn't diminish his ability or his control or his reign in any way. He created all that exists. He is God over all that exists. Solomon is saying here that God is sovereign. There's an old children's song that we sing, and I, I sing it to my grandchildren from time to time, where we talk about he's got the whole world in his hands. Do you remember that? I think some of the greatest scriptural lessons are crystallized in children's songs and poems. I really do. We've got to get it real simple so the children can grasp it. Well, maybe some of us thick-headed adults will get it eventually as well. That God is, he's got the whole world. And we say, he's got the whole world in his I'm not going to sing it for you. You'll run out of here screaming this morning. We talk about he's got the wind and the rain. He's got the brothers and the sisters. He, he's got us all in his hands. He's got the whole world. Let's say that together. He's got the whole world in his hands. Do you believe that today? 
This world looks like it's out of control. This world looks like it's in total chaos, and it is in certain places. And we wonder sometimes about politics and, and all kinds of things. Even though all of that is still occurring, I can assure you God's still on his throne. He is not toppled from his throne. He's not the He's not the old gray-haired, long-bearded grandfather that's seen now and can't see anymore and doesn't know what's going on. He, is a, he has all of his faculties, and he's in control. And when the time is right, he will reveal himself and his will to this world. Remember when Joshua, I'm going to preach just a little bit this, this morning. You remember when Joshua led the children of Israel across the Jordan River? As they were going into the promised land, they're getting ready to face Jericho and that great battle there. The Bible says that God stopped the flow of the water of the Jordan River. And it was at flood stage, so it was, it was out of its banks already. But God stopped it, and God dried up the ground. And the people of Israel walked through that dry ground just like they did 40 years before through the Red Sea. God takes them now through the Jordan River. They come out on the other side, and Joshua instructs the people to pick up stones. He said, pick up 12 stones, one for each tribe of the nation of Israel. And then when they got on the other side, he put those up into a monument, into a marker. And he put those there to represent the, the power of Almighty God. And he says, when the children ask why you did these things, in Joshua chapter 4, verse 24, he says that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand hand of the Lord is mighty so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Have you realized yet that the hand of Almighty God is all-powerful and it is a power that is forever, that is not diminished in any way? Our God is sovereign. Nikolai Tesla, who was the scientist who invented the method for uh, producing electricity and what we call alternating current, was said to be a greater genius than Alexander Graham Bell. Said that he would sit it in his house uh, by, by a window in a, a mohair chair and during storms, and he would watch for uh, the lightning to strike. And, he's, and they say that when, when the Tesla saw the lightning strike, that he would just clap and just laugh. And someone said it was one genius recognizing another genius at work. That's our God. He is a genius at work. He, he, he is so far beyond our ability to understand. God is sovereign. I'm trying to make that point. Have you got it yet? God is sovereign. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6 says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. You can buck God all you want to, but in the end, you're going to have to submit to him because he alone is sovereign. So God is sovereign. That's number one. Number two, death is serious. That's a lesson that he talks about in this passage, that death is a very serious, certain thing in everyone's life. He says it here in verse two. He says, there is one fate. And he's wrestling with this because he's thinking about all the good people and all the bad people. He's thinking about all the righteous people, all the unrighteous people. He's thinking about all the folks that have been great successes in their life. And he's thinking about all the folks that have been miserable failures in their life. And he says there is one destiny for them all, and that is that they die. That they die. Now, when you start talking about death, sometimes there's a somber tone that settles in on the crowd. And he said, oh, no, that preacher, he's going to talk about death. Have you noticed that people don't like to talk about death? We will do almost anything to avoid the subject of death. As a matter of fact, we'll, we'll reference death in other ways. And I've, I've come across a few of those today, and I've listed them in alphabetical order on my notes, and I'm going to read them just in case I get tickled and I lose my place. So what are some of the ways that people refer to death? They say, well, he bit the dust, he bought the farm, he was called away, he was called home, he cast in his chips, he crossed over, he departed, he expired, he fell asleep, he gave up the ghost, he's gone, he kicked the bucket, he's laid to rest, he's laid, he's lost, he met his maker, he passed away, he pegged out, he's perished, he's pushing up daisies, he's resting in peace, he's sang the swan song, he shuffled off the mortal coil, he's six feet under, he's sleeping with the fishes, he's taken, he took his last breath. Breath. He went beyond the veil. He went to a better place. He went to his reward. 
No, he died. It, she died. She died. You know, we go to a funeral home sometimes, and, and the remains are there in the casket, and we walk in, and we're like, oh, well, don't he look natural? <laughs> no, he looks dead. And honestly, he ain't there, okay? That's, that's the body he or she left behind. They've gone on somewhere else. Woody Allen once quipped, he said, I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. Well, that's funny, isn't it? But the truth is, he will be there. He will be there because we all die. And that's what Solomon is saying here. The scripture says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then in Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of that sin is death. The result of the cumulative effect of sin of all mankind is the fact that all mankind dies. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 says, Is it appointed to men to die once? You have an appointment with what they call the grim reaper. Whether you like it or not, whether you like to think of it or not, you know, there's a television commercial now about don't run, uh, don't run the uh, railroad crossing tracks. And there's a grim reaper sitting in the back seat. Have you seen that one? Okay, it says, don't, don't, don't try to run the, the, the lights. You know, don't try to beat the train because you never beat the train. Listen, there's a grim reaper that we have an appointment with. It's, it's the date of death. We don't know when that's going to happen. When Paul talked about death, he said, death is the last enemy that we have to face, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 26. And honestly, most people are totally unprepared for that appointment someday. We spend our life and spend our time, our energy, and our money doing all kinds of things. But when death finally comes, it's like, oh, well, I never thought this was going to happen to me. If I could just have a little bit more time, then certainly I would be better ready for this. Someone said the reason that car companies stay in business is because of the way cars are designed. Do you know that cars are not designed to last forever? <laughs> Duh. Well, there's a, there's a phrase for that. It's called planned obsolescence. Planned obsolescence. That certain, that vehicles are just planned to be obsolete after a certain period of time. Do you know that your body is planned obsolescence? That your body is not planned to last forever in this world? That it's going to expire someday. That's another term we use, okay? That, that you, you are not designed to live in your body in this world forever. And whether God gives you 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years, I don't know. But there's going to come a time when the person you are, your soul, your spirit, whatever you want to call it, the, the person that you really are, it's inside your flesh, is going to leave your body and you are going to die. So here's number three. Solomon talks about the fact that judgment is sure. Death is certain and judgment is sure. After death, what happens, Brother Donnie? Okay, preacher, you got it all figured out. What happens after death? Well, the Bible says that we stand before God and we give an account for our life. And I wish I could have a happy, feel-good point right now, but I just have to tell you what's in the text. And the text says that after you die, you stand in front of Almighty God who is sovereign, and you answer for the life that you have lived. Solomon says in verse 1, man doesn't know whether it will be love or hatred. Anything awaits him. He, he says, we're, we're not sure what's going to, to await us when we stand in the presence of Almighty God. So he had some questions about, what was going to happen when he stood in front of God on that day? And rightly so, <laughs> because here's a guy that made a lot of bad choices in his life. The scripture tells us that he had sexual relationships with many, many women. And in doing so, he violated the standard of marriage that God gave us in Genesis, which is one man for one woman for life. It's that simple. You said, now, wait a minute, preacher. What about all those other people in the Bible that had multiple wives? Well, they also violated God's standard for marriage given in Genesis and also affirmed by Jesus. One man for one woman for life. You say, then it's God's will for every person to marry? No, no, it's not. I think God gives the gift of singleness to some people to serve him 
as one individual in this world, but for those that marry, there's the standard of marriage. And Solomon violated that over and over and over again. Should he wonder what's going to happen when he stands in the presence of God? Yeah, I think he should wonder. He married many foreign women, which he was specifically told not to do. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 17 warned him against this. Do not marry these foreign women because they worship pagan idols and they're going to lead your heart astray to worship those pagan idols. And the very thing that God told him not to do, he did. And the very thing that God told him was going to happen, happened. They led his heart astray. King Solomon assembled thousands of horses, which was a sign of great power in his day, even though he was forbidden to do so in Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 16. Don't assemble these, these weapons of war. And I can take you to Megiddo today. I've been there a few times in ancient Israel, which is one of his stable cities. He had great, great uh, assemblies of horses there. He was ordered by Moses. This is interesting. Moses said that when you get a king, that the king is to copy God's law and he's to read it every day and obey it. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 18 and following. As far as we know, he never did, did that either, either. I wonder how different his life would have been if he had copied God's word and read it and obeyed it every day as the king of Israel. He had doubts. He had doubts about what God would say about his life, but he had no doubts that he would stand in front of God and answer for his life. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed to men to die once, and after this comes the judgment. It comes the judgment. Adrian Rogers, who was that great preacher of uh, Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, once was preaching about the promiscuous sexual climate in our culture. And uh, he said, uh, teenagers talk about going all the way in sexual relationships. He said, you young person, you have not gone all the way until you stand before God in judgment. You stand before God in judgment. He said, you're free to choose, but you're not free to choose the consequences of your choices. And we have to live with those consequences, sometimes in this life and then ultimately in his presence. And when you talk about judgment, people say, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I don't really want to accept that, that, that uh, concept because I think I'm just as good as the guy next to me. I'm just as good as my neighbor or as my wife or... I'm just as good as the person that I work with. Well, you see, that's a comparison issue. And it's okay to compare as long as you have the right model to compare yourself with. And the right model is not your neighbor. It's not your, your spouse. It's not your coworker. The model is the Lord Jesus himself. And so you stand alongside him and you measure up to him. He's, he's the standard. And the truth is, none of us measure up to his standard. So we're in a mess. Hebrews 4.15 says of Jesus, he was tempted in all things yet without sin. Now, if I have to compare myself who I know I'm not perfect, would you say you're not perfect? I, I know I'm not perfect. And if I have to compare myself to Jesus who is perfect, who lived a perfect life, a sinless life, I'm in I'm in a mess. I mean, if God doesn't do something, if, if something doesn't change so that the sin is removed from my life, then I'm sunk. I'm destined for a devil's hell forever and ever and ever. So my life is, is not going to be good when I stand in front of the Lord unless God does something to help me out. And here's the good news. He did. He did through Jesus Christ. He sent his son into the world to live and die and pay for my sins so that those could be forgiven and be removed. So that when I stand before him someday, he sees me through the blood of Christ, which covers me and forgives me of all of my iniquity, as the scripture describes it. Romans 6, 23 again says, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if you haven't accepted Christ as your Savior, I would beg you to do so today because without Christ, you're in a mess. And, and there is really nothing to look forward to beyond that. But if you know Christ, there's everything to look forward to. 
in this life and in the next one to come. So here's the fourth lesson that I see Solomon teaching us in this passage, and that is this, life is sweet. Life is sweet. Now, of course, given those things that we've just talked about, if, if you know the Lord in a personal way and you know your sins are forgiven, there are some things you ought to celebrate because he says in verse 9, enjoy life, enjoy life. You know, life is filled with many wonderful blessings. Over the last 48 hours, I've seen text after message after email that have just bombarded me with the problems in people's lives. I mean, there's COVID sickness, it seems like, everywhere. There are people that are dying. There are all kinds of emergency surgeries that are happening. There are people that are struggling to make their bills. I mean, there's just one issue after another. And I wonder sometimes, Lord, is this all there is? And, and I have to pause and, and think about it and pray about it. And I say, no, wait a minute. No, no, no. This is not all there is. Because I know, God, you are good. You are good. You say, how do you know that, Donnie? I know that because he's been good to me. He's been very good to me. Does that take away all the stuff that I'm struggling with? No, it does not. That stuff is still there. It doesn't go away. Uh, go away. When I wake up in the morning, it'll probably still be there. All that stuff I'm still dealing with. But I have to go back to the, to the sound assurance that my God is good and my God has blessed me in the past. He is blessing me now. And he will bless me in the days to come. In the days to come. So we all have to adjust. We all have to adapt as we move through the circumstances of life. Like when our grandbaby was born um, yesterday. I think it was yesterday. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I couldn't be there. Couldn't go into the hospital. I think that's a crime against humanity they wouldn't let poppy go into the hospital okay and uh i mean i have pictures out at dch where i held my first grandchild in uh, my arms when she was born 21 years ago and i've tried to be there as much as i can you know i'm from an age where when babies used to be born they wouldn't let the daddies anywhere near <laughs> that place uh, i remember when our first child was born i was stationed at the end of a hallway all the way down from the delivery room. And a nurse would come out every couple of hours and say, well, it'd be just a little bit longer, a little bit longer. About 6.30 the next morning, I'd been through this all night long. About 6.30 the next morning, I turned to my mom and dad sitting beside me, and I said, if that nurse comes out and tells me that one more time, I'm going to strangle her. <laughs> I know that baby's got to be here, got to be here. And, of course, she was born a few minutes later. So... You just have to adapt to the circumstances of life. You cry out to God, you hang on to him, you pray for grace and know that God's going to see you through whatever it is. He'll wipe the tears away. He will help you through it because he is good. And so celebrate the goodness of God. Celebrate how God has blessed your life. If I ask every one of you to stand up today and give me some type of testimony about how God has, is blessing you right now, you could do it. You could do it. You might have to wipe a few tears away, and you might have to put some, some burdens in the back of your mind somewhere, but God's good to you. He's good to you. His blessings continue throughout all of your life, and so uh, Solomon just says, celebrate life. Celebrate life. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17 says, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. God wants you to enjoy life. Now, here's what Solomon had to learn. He had to learn to worship the God who gave him blessings and not the blessings themselves. He got that a little confused in his life. He started worshiping the stuff, worshiping the things, instead of the God who gave him the things. And Americans make that same mistake from time to time, I'm afraid. Every good thing, James says, and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of shifting. You know what that last part means? God doesn't change. And the same God who loved you and blessed you in the past is the same God who loves you and is going to bless you now if you'll look to him and trust in him. He is good. 
He is good. He is good. So enjoy life. Enjoy life. Life is sweet, and life is so sweet. Life is sweet. Cherish every moment. I would say to those of you who are parents, cherish every moment with your children because you'll blink and they'll be 20 years old. I mean, they grow up so fast. If you're in college, I'd say cherish the days that you have in class. Cherish those. Use those uh, opportunities to, uh, as best you can because you'll be out of school before long and then you'll be working on the job. And you say, mm, man, I wish I was back in college again. Wish I could have some of those opportunities again. And then if you like me, you're getting, you know, your hair may be getting kind of length, uh, gray and thin. And, you know, you say, well, I wish I was 40 again. You know, I wish I had those opportunities again. Life is just so short. It sweeps by so quickly. So celebrate it while you can. Let me finish with this one. Because of all those things we've talked about, I think Solomon is telling us to focus on serving God. Focus on serving God while you can. Because life is sweet. Life is short. He says in verse 10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Whatever God gives you to do in this world, do it to the best of your ability because you are serving God ultimately and you want God to get glory from what you're doing. Our God is a working God and he calls us to work in this world for him. John chapter 5 and verse 17, Jesus said, My Father is working until now, and I myself am working, working, working. Learn the value of a strong work ethic. You're not entitled to anything. Get up and go to work and be glad that God has given you a job and an opportunity to do something in this world to make a contribution to the betterment of our world and our society and our city but beyond that, whatever you do, do it for the honor and glory of God who gave you the job and who gave you the, the intelligence to do it and the strength and the health to get out of bed and go do it every day. God wants us to work because he is a working God. I read about a man who, uh, a farmer, had several sons and they had a large corn crop and he'd send his sons out to work in the field and they'd work hard all day long while their peers were off playing around. Someone criticized him one day and said, why do you make your boys work so hard out there in the cornfield? Don't you, you don't need all that corn. And the farmer said, you're right. I don't need all that corn. I'm not raising corn. I'm raising boys. You want to raise some boys and raise some girls, right? Put them to work, put them to work. God works and he wants us to work and serve him in this world. Second Thessalonians 3.10 said, if anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. I'm not sure why I put that verse in there. I just thought it'd be good to share right now. Work. Go to work. Nobody owes you anything. The government doesn't owe you anything. And honestly, God doesn't owe you anything. Everything that you have is a gift from God. So serve him out of your heart with all that is within you so that he might get honor and glory from your life. So how do you respond? Well, you know what I did last Sunday, so let's do it again today. Get the welcome card, the connection card that's there in front of you or beside you or somewhere. And there are some ways to respond on the bottom of it. One is I'd like to connect with someone about following Jesus and discipleship and our baptism. We haven't talked a lot about the cross today, but honestly, Jesus died on the cross so that you could know him personally. And if you don't know how to do that, then just call me, connect with Rick or Patrick, or I mean, there are dozens of people in here that can help you know Jesus and follow him with your life. So if you'll check that on your card and just let us know, we'll be glad to try to help you. Uh, secondly, serving and volunteering at Forest Lake. Um, there are so many opportunities to serve the Lord through this church. I can't remember most of them, certainly not right now, but you can find them on our website. And let's say that God's guiding you to do something that our church is not involved in at all. Great. Let, let me know. Let one of our pastors know. We'll be glad to sit down with you and resource you in some way because God brings people into the body to help the body of Christ do what he needs done in a community. So if God's brought you into this body, then we want to help you serve God as he's guiding you to. 
And if you don't even know where to start, just let us know. Check the box, and we'll be glad to follow up with you and help you find a place to serve in some way. If God's guiding you to become a member of our church, we would welcome you here. Again, we believe God adds to the body to equip the body to do his work in a place. So if God's guiding you to do that, just check the box, and we'll show you what the next steps are. All right? Great. Let's bow together and pray. Father, thank you for those who are in the building and for those who are online as we've worshipped you this morning. And we just want to pull all of this to a conclusion now and just say to you, God, we're so grateful for your blessings on our lives. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to be our Savior and to make life worth living and to give us hope that is beyond anything that we deserve or could ever expect. Thank you, Lord, for being with us through the difficulties of life and thank you for the great blessings of life that we just so readily recognize every day. Help us now to present ourselves as a, an offering to you so that you would be pleased and honored with our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.